resistance because of how we are acculturated, um, how our racial identity development happens. It's not um, happenstance. <laughs> it's not, we're not just born that way. We are acculturated to it and our racial identity development really, uh, and where we are along that continuum really determines how we can engage uh, with race, with racism and with racial justice. So um, that's what we're gonna talk about a little bit tonight. Carolina, did you want to um, add something? Anything? Uh, okay. Yeah, I think that, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently the cat wants to add something. I'm sorry about that. Um, that's just him. So I think that in reflecting on this, um, I would like to draw people's attention to, as we kind of progress through the conversation, how rooted a lot of these things are in white supremacy. And so many things when I was really reviewing and thinking about this material brought me back to, oh yeah, that's individualism. Oh yeah, that's, you know, that's um, right to comfort, right? Right to comfort comes up a lot. So um, we just want to recognize that that everything we look at is grounded in white supremacy culture and that is where white resistance comes from and that is where this material like it is the next step out from that and says aha here's how it all looks so i think that was it and if, if there was something else i'm sure i will figure it out along the way <laughs> awesome thank you um so any questions about that anybody oh i guess we should say to our um our style if you weren't on our first two webinars our style that um carolina donna renfro and i have sort of uh come up with is um having a more conversation style between the facilitators um so that we're not just talking heads up here uh, and then we really want to engage you all um, this is why we wanted to do it and this kind of Zoom conference, so um, it could be interactive and you can ask questions and tell us your experiences and share your stories too. So if there aren't any questions about the intro, um, and if you do have them, feel free. Um, those of us who aren't talking will be watching the chat and we will try to keep up with that and bring that in as we feel uh, is pertinent. Okay. All right seeing nothing um so tonight uh and if you looked at the uh reference materials at all we are drawing from um beverly tatum's work her book talking about race and learning about racism um is uh <laughs> is about uh the application of her racial identity development theory in the classroom it's rooted in the classroom so um she she did two different sort of continuums one for people of color which we'll talk about uh in a little bit and then uh the racial development stage for white people so there are six stages for white folks and the first stage she has labeled contact and so this is really the beginning stage of racial identity development you know um people who may not have encountered uh any um people who are different from them who have different racial identity developments um and they really uh haven't had a lot of curiosity um and maybe even fear of people of color based on stereotypes that they learned either from their family or their community or friends or even the media and their lives are really structured so that they limit the interaction with people of color and so really don't have any um experience let alone relationships with people of color and you know some people can remain in that initial stage their entire lifetimes right we know um you know we know that as white people it's possible to structure your life that way in this country if we want to and so this is where we often see so you know do you ever have those conversations with people if you're bringing up race and people say well i don't really see color <laughs> right <laughs> You know, or, you know, we're all the same inside or, well, we're all from Africa originally. <laughs> you know, those are some of the, some of the um, kinds of statements that come from complete, um, 
naivete and lack of experience with folks of color. So um, I'm sure most of us have had heard comments like that or had conversations with folks like that. Right, Carolina? <laughs> Right. So, so it's been really interesting. I, I've been, been really trying to reflect on this because um, so much of my formation has been a little bit different than other people's for a variety of reasons. And I kind of noticed when I looked at this that I've had kind of two, two different developments, right? One was the unconscious part of it. And some of these parts I kind of missed. Um, I was exposed to people of color as a young person. I never saw anything wrong with that. I wasn't maybe enculturated in the same way that many, many people are in this country um, when I was very young. So I always w kind of was around folks of color, both that were in, in my social sphere and in other social spheres. And then there's been my conscious development, which once I really started recognizing anti-racism work, and it's almost like having a new like childhood where consciously, right, I went through these stages where I, I was maybe at an, on an unconscious level already at a much later stage in the development. And then all of a sudden consciously was in earlier stages of the development. Does that make any sense? Yeah. And actually you bring up a good point that as we go through these stages, you know, as in so much of development, especially folks who've raised kids, you know, that development is not a straight line. Right. And in any one of these stages, we can go back and forth. And as Carolina pointed out, you know, either consciously or unconsciously, because I agree, I was raised from a pretty early age um, to be around um, people of color. And so I don't, I can't say that I consciously ever remember being at that stage, consciously or unconsciously. Um, so yeah, I, I can't remember a lot of experience with it. Um, not that I had in any way a systemic analysis, right? right? And then when we kind of wake up to all of that, right, then we're all of a sudden sort of in the contact stage where all of a sudden we are seeing differences and we're seeing systemic oppression and it's all kind of very new, you know? So, um, so I, I find, and, and when we're confronted with that and feel that we've been oblivious to that, you know, um, and really have to start examining, you know, why was I so oblivious, right? Right. right. And that's kind of how I identified that. Like, I really, what I what, although I was in a largely white community, um, like in grade school, there were people of color and I had a lot of interactions with them, probably more than most kids, right? Some of them lived very near me and we were friends and, and there was, because I had, I had European um, parents, so the ideas about race were not in my family as they were in other families, mm -hmm. right? Like we didn't we didn't understand black people in the context that most most Americans do, right? right? right. Um, we didn't have we have we have opinions about other folks of color, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like where I come from, it's the Turks and the Yugoslavs that get kind of what black folks and, and Latino folks get in America. So, but there were, wasn't any real predisposition. So my befriending them was not a problem. Um, but then coming back to when I came into awareness, I had to, I had to really struggle with some of that stuff where I had not. And I wondered, wait, I, I wondered how the friendships were with folks of color with essentially an oblivious white girl if that makes any sense right yeah, yeah i can really um relate to that because i think I, as i tell <laughs> i tell this story often but like i was that little kid who ran around and you know part of it i have to you know shout out to being raised a unitarian universalist i was that kid who ran around whenever i saw something that i thought was unfair saying that's not fair that's not fair <laughs> And so that included, 
you know, when I was friends with people of color, and if I was treated in a racial way, right, as a white person, that seemed unfair to me, you know? And so that kind of bumps you into a different kind of awareness, right? Um, when um, you really understand, okay, well, race really is a thing in the world, right? So that's sort of, that's Beverly Tatum's second stage, which she calls disintegration. And so as you have increased interactions with people of color, you get new information about racism, like, okay, they may feel about you a certain kind of way because you are white, right? Um, and you represent a lot of oppression and injustice uh, in their lives and in the history of their family's lives uh, in this country. Um, and so, uh, when the first, it's kind of when the, when the shades come off, right? When the eyes are lifted, um, a lot of white people can respond with guilt, uh, shame, sometimes anger at the recognition that we, you know, even it, in an unconscious way, but you kind of get an inkling that you do have an advantage by being white. You know, it's the first sort of glimpse into white privilege. Um, and that it's an icky feeling, right? <laughs> when, when you realize that you are um, a participant and a benefactor of a system of white privilege and white supremacy, and that just your being in it helps sustain it, you know? And there's nothing we can do about that um, right now. Um, and so, uh, again, it comes to adjust to that discomfort, you know, and um, kind of, equalize, you know, find equilibrium with our emotions is that, um, you know, either you go into denial or you will um, take it out on people of color, right? Because it's their fault that you feel this way. <laughs> so uh, there's a lot of blame because there's a lot of pressure, as we know, especially today, you know, what's being brought out in the movement for Black Lives is that, you um, there's a lot of pressure to keep the status quo, right? All the backlash that we're seeing from the advance of the movement, that is, those are efforts to keep the status quo. So the same thing can happen to you. <laughs> and, um, you know, I've definitely experienced those times when folks um, uh, in workshops, I was doing a workshop with mediators and there was a woman of color who was um, talking about an experience that she had. And this one white woman got so angry. And her response when I called on her, because of course she raised her hand, um, she said, you know, well, I feel like you're saying all white people are racist. <laughs> you know, and that's, and she stayed mad the entire, you know, the workshop was a half a day long and she stayed mad the entire time, right? Because um, she just could not integrate the fact that a person of color could talk about an experience where she felt she was discriminated against because um, it completely, it, it immediately translated into all white people are, are racist. Right. You know, I, what I find really interesting about this stage, and I don't, I don't often get to the point where I'm, again, I'm kind of blaming folks of color, but I find I, what I really love about this sentence um, is that um, attempts to um, attempts to reduce discomfort may include denial or attempt to change significant others' attitudes towards people of color, which which I am I'm I have been there over and over and over again, right? Um, not in the denial piece, but kind of like wanting people who are important to me in my life to shift their view so I feel more okay about being white, you know, that we're, it's not all white folk. Um, and I notice, what I notice about this stage, although I never personally, unconsciously went through this stage, now in my conscious anti-racism work, this is where I go when I'm stressed out. This is where I go when I have heard one too many ugly things, when I have maybe spent too much time in workshops um, or too much time in other spaces where um, 
where I kind of feel like, like we're nowhere, right? And then I start getting, getting really, really um, angry and I'm trying to convert people, right? I get into this conversion mode and it isn't from a place of equanimity. It is from a place of fix this so my world can be better, right? Right. Which roots back into, but I, I find that when I'm stressed out, this exact fa- phase is where I go. Mm-hmm. And that's a little scary to me, right? Because it's not a good place to be. Right. Um, and I think a lot about how do I get out, right? Like, so I'm wondering, does, does this resonate with anybody here? And if so, anybody can help me with my stuckness? Deborah? I was switching from computer to phone, whatever else. I was just going to say, I'm not sure I've ever heard this many you use be quiet for this long, especially when somebody else asks to, for, for, for like advice. <laughs> um, but I, I feel your pain and I also feel your description about, you know, we want people to be making other different, what we perceive to be better choices. Um, and I think you've already made the first step because you're aware of it. and you can't do anything different until you're aware of it. So kudos to you. (laughs) So Deborah, I take it you can't see me. So I just give you a thumbs up. I'm just saying, thank you. Oh, absolutely. We're all in this together. I mean, I think that's why we're all on the call. At least that's why I'm on the call. (laughs) I won't speak for anybody else. Right. And for those on the phone who can't see the chat, um, we have a comment from Leslie Ronells uh, who says, I certainly feel that too. Can't help with how to get unstuck because I'm still working on that. Yeah, it, it's tough because it's nice being white, right? <laughs> you know, that we there are a lot of perks that go along with this. That's what helps keep us uh, where we are and keep us stuck. Um, Leslie also says, one thing to work on is not getting burnout. What does getting burnout even mean? What internalized racial superiority is making us burn ourselves out of a sense of urgency, et cetera? Amen. Amen. That is a question that I ask myself a lot. And I think when we get to the later stages, one of the things I kind of surmise is if we actually kind of maybe more normally are in the later stages of this development model, um, what conditions can we create to get back to those stages, right? Including support systems and and conditions and and self-care and whatnot. How do we get back to that? but so reintegration, if, if, does anybody have anything to say about disintegration other than helping me with my stuckness? Um, is there anything you well, might know? Hmm? There was just one thing else I was going to say was about um, uh, communities we're mentioning and that, you know, um, when we are a lot uh, in communities with majority white folks, um, you know, that can actually help us stay stuck, right? Um, because, you know, <laughs> bad feelings can be breed bad feelings, right? So sometimes, um, you know, yeah, we just have to get frustrated enough um, to want to move into the next phase, the reintegration phase. So go ahead. You were going to start to talk about that. I just wanted to make sure nobody else had anything like any thoughts on disintegration before we move. Not that we're not going to bounce around. We're going to bounce around a lot. This work seems to make us bounce. Um, But if anybody else has any thoughts, they'd like to share um, things you've noticed either in yourself or in your communities 
um, we'd love to hear it before we kind of transition into the next phase. So for me, and this is Deborah again, I actually think that part of this goes back into our theology of um, social gospel theology for those of us coming out of Christian traditions of, you know, the world's not going to get more just unless we roll up our sleeves and make it so. Um, and there's always more work to be done. Um, and it doesn't matter how exhausted and tired and bloody and blistered my hands might be. They're the only hands to do the work. And so, you know, I got to do it. Um, which I think isn't necessarily a balanced or healthy approach, but I think we can look back and see how it's grounded in some of the traditions that we've come out of and, and that Unitarian Universalism has come out of as well. Sure, that Puritan work ethic, right? <laughs> You're not a good person unless you are working. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and that God's not going to make the world more just. We have to do it. Talk about the weight of the world on our shoulders. Well, I, I just like to, the weight of the world on, on our shoulders is an interesting phrase here because um, I, I feel sometimes we think that it's only our problem to solve, um, that we're the only one that can get this done. And so we have a sense of urgency and intensity around that. And, you know, like uh, the, the problem is, is this is not a rational uh, problem to solve through uh, logic and effort. It's an emotional um, issue, in my opinion, a lot of times. And, uh, you know, to, to be effective, I think you, 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 learn, you are more effective as you demonstrate through your own actions what you are doing. And find those people that are willing to begin to look and, and to listen and to, to learn, as opposed to trying to change everybody, because not everybody is in that place. Thank you. Yeah, that's a really great. And again, what Fred just said, you know, goes back to, to white supremacy culture, right? Thinking we're the only one who's going to fix it. So there's some, a lot of internalized superiority there. Right. So even, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Go, go ahead. <laughs> so even, even when we're concerned with racial justice, you know, this is where that savior complex comes in, right? <laughs> we think we're the ones who can do it to help those, you know, less fortunate than we are. And so this is the sort of the third phase, this reintegration phase where we're really, uh, <laughs> con uh, what's the word I want to say? Um, it's uh, counterintuitive that uh, while we are working for racial justice, it really throws us back into wanting to be in our white superiority, right? Because, um, because it's uncomfortable, right? To be acknowledging and understanding the racial injustice that, you know, our society was founded on. And so it's, it's like you have one foot in both places, right? You can work for racial justice, but you, and think that we are the only ones, we have the answer, right? We can do it. So. Yeah, and I'm seeing so much, I think with the Black Lives Matter movement, we see, I think, a lot of people who are kind of, kind of moving into that phase where they, they, were, they, they were down with the movement until it got uncomfortable. And then there's a lot of, you know, criticism about tactics and, oh, no, but you shouldn't be so disruptive and, and all of that. And that just really feels like, that feels like a, almost like a retreat, right? Like this, I mean, here we have this list, which is nice bullet pointed and looks like it's very progressive, but this almost feels like a little, woo! Back, backslide, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So... The other thing I've noticed about this, Carrie, and I would be really curious to know some of your experiences because I truly have never had reintegration experience. I've never, like I've, be, because I so didn't, I, I was so much a part of other communities, mostly communities of color, 
like I didn't, I never kind of adopted the white community as my own, right? I recognize it is my own and I'm doing some of that work now, okay. but it wasn't like I ever wanted to retreat over there. Um, so I'd be really, this is not a phase that I have personal experience with. So I'm trying to understand it because I see a lot of people doing it and I'm trying to identify how can I help people who are white allies to move, right? Yeah, um, yeah. I, I notice it, it comes up for me, you know, when I'm out there, I think I'm, I'm fighting the good fight, you know, and I um, breach a boundary, right? And I step on toes at the people of color and I get told about it. Um, and I want to go back into my kind of <laughs> safe place where I think, oh, okay, I'm a good white person. You know, so that's where I experience it. You know, it's it's um, uh, sort of these isolated incidents that happen. But that's exactly where I go and what comes up. Like, I'm going to go because I can. Right. I have that privilege of going and retreating in my white world. I have lots of places where I can do that. You know, one of them is my church, <laughs> unfortunately. So, um, uh, yeah, that's. That's kind of where I notice it in myself. Anybody else have that experience? No? Nope. Is this making sense for folks? <laughs> yeah, okay, I see. Thanks, George. <laughs> I see some head nods. Oh. Um, so yeah, so it's easy. I, you know, I'm, what's coming up for me is Peggy McIntosh's, you know, the uh, invisible knapsack of privilege, you know, and her list of the things that we can do as white people and stay, you know, in our white world and kind of have our expectations met in terms of what services and how we can be true, how we can expect to be treated. Um, and, uh, and where we can just be ourselves. <laughs> um, but, but if we're aware, we have to realize that we were acculturated in white supremacy culture, and that's why it feels comfortable to be in those spaces. Um, but um, the, next, the next phase, the fourth stage that Beverly Tatum talks about is the pseudo-independent stage. And this is where um, white people might start seeking information about uh, people of color. Um, that's sort of where it starts, you know, either with books or movies, or they might start a conversation with a person of color um, because they're beginning to abandon those beliefs in white superiority, okay? And, um, uh, and they're looking to those who are targeted by racism um, to help him or her understand, you know? Oftentimes you might hear it said that, um, an inclination for white folks is to become educated by people of color about their oppression. So this is, this is sort of where you see that it's kind of like taking baby steps, <laughs> you know, learning to walk. And so uh, you rely on, you know, like a toddler holds furniture. It's kind of like white people hold, hold on to people of color to, uh, to try to get their education. Um, and of course, you know, uh, there's also, Again, I don't know why, you know, so <laughs> part of white supremacy culture is the binary, right? Either or. So if I'm going to be an ally to people of color, that means I have to leave white people behind, you know? And so um, <laughs> uh, there's a rejection of one's own sort of culture in order to align oneself with another culture. So that's another sort of um, characteristic of this stage. Um, they can feel alienation from other white folks, right? Because they are becoming aware or, um, of uh, racial injustice and about racism. And so um, they can uh, feel alienated, like I said, from uh, other whites who haven't begun to examine their own racism, right? So you're gonna feel out of step with the dominant white culture for the most part. And, um, but also, you know, 
people of color don't love to be <laughs> spending all their time educating white folks. So white people can often experience rejection from people of color um, to go and, and find their own um, educating sources. So <clears throat> I have a story about this stage. Uh -huh. <laughs> if you're ready for it. I'm ready for it. I don't know. I don't want, I didn't want to interrupt you, but no, but this one, this, I'll tell you, this made me laugh so hard when I read it initially. Um, this seems to happen when I get at resource material because my story is about other resource material. So I was kind of in this phase where I was in anti-racist formation um, really hardcore formation. I was reading everything and going to workshops and doing all the things and I had developed this very, very strong anti-racist identity and, and indeed kind of sort of a lifestyle, right? And very much a passion for it. And then I, uh, in, in, a, in a workshop that was done about, I, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure what it was about, but I'm sure it was about white resistance or something. Mm -hmm. um, the, that was my first encounter with Tema Okun's Culture of White Supremacy Resource. So here I am, and at this point I had already led some workshops, you know, like I know my stuff and I do the things and whatever. And here I encounter this, um, this resource that basically identifies some of the behaviors I do a lot, right? I tend to lean towards, not maybe some that other people do a lot, but I tend to be uber objective. I tend to be uber binary. That might have a little bit of a link with my autism. I tend to be, you know, uber this and uber that. And I certainly kind of think quite a bit of myself, right? I think I'm pretty far ahead of everybody else. And that, initial, my initial reading of that resource hit me so hard because I realized that some of my behaviors were still incredibly oppressive. Mm -hmm. and, and although I wasn't looking to folks of color to educate me, I was looking for education, looking for education. And... Um, and maybe some from folks of color, I don't know, but a lot of the things I did were essentially identified as still oppressive. And that kind of sent me into a little bit of a tailspin. I thought like, oh my God, you know, what is wrong with me? Who am I? All of this stuff. Um, fortunately, I kind of came out of it. But all of the things that she lists here um, is, were things I experienced and I wish maybe I would have had this list to make some sense of the thing that I really felt was just this anomalous experience. Right. So, um, so yeah, so that was a, a while back. Um, and I, I would be curious to hear from people about if they have found themselves there um, or in pieces of there. Um, and the other piece I noticed is in certain spaces, and particularly in UU spaces, this is where I am. There are some people that maybe don't quite trust me yet. They don't maybe know me yet. Maybe I'm doing it a little wrong for being a UU. But in my local communities, I am, and my local organizing, I'm absolutely not in this space. Mm. So I think it's very interesting for me yeah. to be moving up and down and bopping around, right? And having different experiences of this development almost simultaneously. Yeah, so I can imagine that could be confusing. <laughs> uh, which, of course is what this stuff all does, um, which again, helps us keep the system in place. Um, and so that's why it's so important to be deliberate in our thinking and our, um, uh, you know, reflecting our, on ourselves and, and this whole thing. And um, 
Oh gosh, it's such a hard balance because I want to say to not be judgmental, but also well, to be accountable, right? To hold ourselves to account um, and as we're learning, right? Because it's so important. In this particular phase of uh, pseudo independence, uh, what really strikes me is this idea that it tends to be an intellectual exercise instead of kind of more of an embodied emotional one. Or, or, and I think for me, this was played out in my life when I was like, my anti racism was theoretical. <laughs> like I, I had, I, I had, I, de I had developed you know, these feelings about it in, in, from reading and, you know, educating myself with books, but all in my room, you know, in, in college. And my experience of it, of actually putting it to the test, you know, was still largely theoretical. And I think sometimes in UU churches that happens too, and, I, and certainly in the churches I've been involved with, we're much more willing to have a forum about something in our safe little space and not, and not ever really actually move into an intersectional space and try to put, put, our, put our theory into practice, you know, the praxis piece of that. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Lori. That's excellent. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I find um, I find it a lot in UU spaces. Well, we always criticize. We are so in our heads. We are so in our heads, right? Um, but I think this this can be in movement spaces. I've encountered this kind of behavior where where somebody is, you know, some activisty person, and they're behaving in profoundly oppressive ways. Um, and you're like, did you, you know, did you do a workshop one time? <laughs> you know, um, so, so I, I find that, yeah, this, this is almost, if I were to, you know, cut things into quantitative pieces, this is where I find a lot of people, whether or not that's you use or, or act, other activists or whatever, and I would be really curious to know if anybody else has something to say about that, because I really just don't want to feel that alone. Hey, this is Jolinda. I've had somewhat different experiences, so I'm not quite sure how to, um, how to approach this um, in a way that fits with everyone else. I, as a very young adult, I made decisions that mean that for the last 45 years, um, the people uh, that I am closest to, that I, I love more than my next breath, are um, more than 50% African American. Um, and, and I've had experiences, I've lived in the inner city for most of my life. Um, at one point, I was the editor, the assistant editor of an African American newspaper, wrote columns and received hate mail uh, from um, white su supremacists who assumed that I was African American. Um, and so in UU spaces, I have several difficulties. One is that even though I've led workshops on anti-racism, I still have trouble with people pushing my buttons. You are talking about people that are so dear to me um, that I really have to work with that before I go into this, this space. Um, and I, I do have trouble with empathy for people who are my age who are just waking up. I that is that's very difficult for me to handle. I often don't speak up at all. Another piece of it is that well, I don't often not speak up at all, but I don't say don't say a whole lot of what I want to say. Um, the other piece of it is if there are African Americans in the room. I hesitate to bring up experiences, for instance, 
For instance, I once owned a car. We lived in the inner city. I once owned a car that was um, uh, that police uh, believed belonged only to gangbangers. And during the day, I could go anywhere I liked, but at night, I could only go a few blocks from my house before I was stopped for, you know, making California turn. Supposedly, my my brake lights weren't working, which, and they were working fine, that kind of thing. Um, so I'm always hesitant about talking about my experiences um, in, in that context. So I don't know whether this fits in here or not, but I, I, one thing I really, really have tried to work on for years is my empathy with people who are first starting out, particularly at, you know, middle-aged and later. Any of that ring any bells with anyone? Absolutely. Absolutely. That is something I personally struggle with. And I think just a note, uh, because I think you brought in a lot of stuff here, Kalinda. We should have a whole another webinar now. Mm -hmm. so, um, the one piece I would, um, mm -hmm. that I, I think that Ka Carrie and I had talked about, we need to recognize we have two um, racial identity developments and one is for white folks and the other is for folks of color and we should probably name right now that um, that we need to be aware of both of them right um, as we move through this work um, the other piece is I have found this and I am a person who <clears throat> has now for the last few years worked a lot at the allies for racial equity booth at General Assembly um, I tend to encounter either people who are already with me and where I am, as Jalinda might know, <laughs> because they come and encounter me. And, um, and then I tend to encounter people who are very fresh in the work, very new in the work, um, exhibit signs of internalized superiority, right? Um, and not a whole lot of formation. And it really occurred to me we need to kind of think about that as emotional violence because here we are confronted with people who we may very well like and love, right? But their worldview doesn't, um, doesn't gel with ours anymore. And considering we're the ones who are wanting that to change, right? That's a strangely and emotionally violent place. And I think to be really aware of that and aware of sometimes how much, I, I really don't like the word self-care, but, but that's just what people call it, so I, I defer, um, how much self-care that actually requires um, and how much support within our community of people who we encounter, who are with us, who kind of get where we are when we're frustrated um, how important that is. So I just, I want to say I totally feel you, Jalinda. I think we, we know that already. Um, and my thoughts on that is, you know, this is where our struggle is, right? And that's a point, right? Is this is where our struggle is. And... Um, and that struggle can propel us into the next stage, <laughs> which is immersion, <laughs> which is where, you know, feeling that discomfort of whiteness and folks who don't understand what it is, you, you begin to seek out allies. And, you know, that's how Allies for Racial Equity in part was formed. Um, wanting, to, uh, wanting to be, to have a community, to have a group that, under, that was where you were, you know? uncomfortable with the status quo and understanding racism. And um, so to looking for those other white people who understood whiteness on the same level as you, I guess is, is a way to put it. Um, uh, it. And it's very helpful for white people in their development to, um, to be in relationship with other white folks who are uh, 
understanding racism and are learning about ways to resist racism and, and undo oppression. So that, um, so yeah, Allies for Racial Equity is one place where you can find that. <laughs> yes. And I, this is, um, this is kind of like where I go, where I try to go. It, and I, I kind of consider it like a little bubble, right? It's a little bubble of where we are. And it may be with white folks, it may be a multiracial environment, but it's kind of like this little bubble where everybody gets where we all are. Um, and I have learned, I think only in the last few years, finally, how important support work, like intentional creating, intentionally those spaces. I, I think I may be a little slow to catch on. I think some people of color have known this for a very long time to create not only um, people of color spaces, like caucusing spaces and white spaces to do the work, but also um, spaces to be held in community and to do some healing, um, that is actually pretty new to me. Mm -hmm. um, and it's still hard for me to think about it, like to be intentional about it. Like when I get into the space, it's like, oh, that was really, really great, you know? And now I feel better and now I can go back out into the world. But then I forget to go and do that, right? To say, hey, after we go do the work together, we also need to create some space in a bubble, right? Yeah, so we can have that space that does a lot of the things we just talked about, you know, is where you can express your frustration, ask questions, even if they're, you know, uh, dumb questions, <laughs> or, uh, you know, celebrate together, heal together. Um, everybody's going to be at different places. and 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 actually and you learn to be in community with people who are in different places so delinda that is sort of exercising that muscle that allows you to be with people who um you know might not be where you are and who might frustrate you or <laughs> um you don't feel like you have patience for and and learning that empathy for folks who are um you know trying to do the right thing but just might not um have the capacity to do it yet um, and so until you get that to that stage, I just want to back up to our topic of white resistance. You know, I, I hope you can see uh, at each of those stages where someone might be exhibiting resistance to any kind of um, racial justice work you want to do in your congregation or in your communities. Um, you know, depending on where they are in their racial identity development, um, whether it's your congregation president or your minister, you know, this is what might be popping up and what you're, what you're kind of up against. Um, did you want to say anything about that, Carolina? Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> There's so much. <laughs> I actually, I would be curious, I, I would be curious, I have always a lot to say, I think if you've been in more than one webinar with me, you'll, you'll know that I have probably sometimes too much to say. Um, I'm really curious, I, I look at the, I, I always look at resources both like kind of as a, a mirror, as a reflective material to kind of gauge where am I, and then also as an analytical tool to gauge what, what am I seeing the most, you know, what, what spaces am I or what types of people or where in their development am I seeing the most am I being challenged with the most and I would be actually really curious to hear some other perspectives um, like we were hoping to have a conversation not just me and Carrie because we can do that on the phone um, but I would be curious um, is there anything in this material where people are like oh yes this is like every other person I talk to or um, or you know and and maybe we can talk more about that and see what can we do to both support each other in maybe our frustration but also what tactics might people have to kind of to to help people move Right, because in the end, that's what we're looking to do right. is to help people move. I can see where you're talking from, Carolina, because 
in my whole life. I've experienced it because of my partners that I've had have all been of color because that was my personal feeling and what drew me in love to them. So it caused a lot of problem family-wise and friend-wise. So it has changed over the years. Thankfully, people are starting to change their mindsets slowly, but it is starting to change in our world, and I'll be thankfully when it's all completely gone and we no longer see anything like that in our world. So would you care to share a little bit about some of your experiences around around some of these behaviors or these, you know, um, w throughout the course of your life or through throughout the course of kind of maybe your anti-racist lens? Well, I've been called a reverse racist because of how I chose to and who I chose to be in love with. <laughs> They didn't like that I was a race traitor, as some called it. So you learn to pick your battles and fight them because if you've got someone getting in your face about it, you know they're going to turn nasty real quick. And if you'd rather be a loving, caring person, you're not going to want to fight a battle over love you're gonna want to show the person that you love you love them and it doesn't matter what color they are because if you're gonna fight about color then they're gonna think you really don't care about them you're out there just because of their color that's how a lot of my friends have lost their relationships because they thought their partner only chose them because of their color. Wow. So. I have something on this one. Um, the Church of the Larger Fellowship has hosted a white uh, allies covenant group for about the last year. And that's a group that meets um, a couple times a month. Mm -hmm. And there's been about five or six of us that do it. And we, it's, it's a space for us to do some support type work, some healing type work, but a lot of also just challenging, gently challenging each other and bringing each other into a broader covenant around these, um, these ideas and concepts and in our work. Um, in the movement. So most of the people in the groups are engaged in some kind of work within their context. And, and frankly, some of those folks are not even in the States, not in the United States. So the context around being a white person in Israel is a very different context than being a white person in, in the States. Uh, but one of the observations that was made by one of the members just today actually was kind of a, falls along this immersion immersion thing, which is that when they first re, when they first realized that we were going to start a covenant group with just white people, <laughs> um, they were kind of skeptical of it <laughs> and um, didn't quite understand the need for it. And I think that echoes a little bit about what Carolina was saying. And it, maybe I mean I don't want to put words in your mouth, but that just now, like 11 months into it, this person has has kind of is seeing the value in it and is really coming to the point where this person understands the need for, um, for some of that kind of space where we can um, kind of, we go out with the tide, do the work, come back in and kind of reflect on it, process it in a, and not only process it, but are willing to articulate our own failings in a space that's safe enough that we feel that we can articulate those failings and deconstruct them and then prepare ourselves for the next time we go out. So that ebb and flow, the title kind of concept was very interesting to me. 
and and a space that's private enough where you're not burdening others right with and and that's something yeah yeah, yeah. that's that's dual fold you're absolutely right we're not burdening others we're not asking for for forgiveness um blanket you know from our our person of color friend <laughs> or we're not saying they did this to me and i felt this way is that okay like they don't have to be the arbiter of that <laughs> you, know? <laughs> it's, you know you know so we come into this space where we can process that stuff with other white folks that are in the work and trying to do the work the self work and so forth and it's helpful it's helpful to get different perspectives and kind of um tease it out i have found it to be very helpful yeah, I have actually wanted to join one of those and then it always never works out for me, but I'm working, I'm, I swear I will be in that because I think that that's an incredibly valuable resource. Yeah. And I think that as people in anti-racism, whether or not it is allies for racial equity or it is multicultural growth and witness or CLF or whatever, I think that's something we really would be wise to focus more on like to do to start really doing more um so so we can actually move into autonomy well well and one last thing i would say is wouldn't it be great if we had hundreds of those groups across the country for you use to do this kind of processing in i mean literally hundreds I <laughs> we're, we're working on it <laughs> For sure. Yes. And we do have one other comment. Um, Linda Dukes in the in the chat has said recently I've encountered two active church members who are white who live in African American communities and spend a lot of time with blacks. They didn't like hearing about white privilege and white fragility. Interesting. Yes. So this wow. is part of this is part of that pseudo independent stage, right? Where they're, you know, rejecting um, what they don't like about what they're hearing from other white folks. Right. Yeah. Thanks for clarifying that. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I all, I also, this reminds me actually of contact, right? Because, because like you can, and that's kind of where I was for a long time. I, you know, I was around people of color. I never, I never had a, so there's kind of like our individual experience and then there is our socio-political experience, right? And that's, I think, maybe better terms than what I had, where all of a sudden, like I would, was completely oblivious to my privilege for a very long time. And if you have a lot of friends of color, and then you're kind of confronted with that, right? And say, so, well, you have privilege, and you're like, no, I have friends of color, and it's, you know, like... I live in these spaces. I, you know, it's whatever. Um, so it's kind of like opening up our socio-political eye and being kind of shocked by what we see. I think. I mean, I'm not saying it isn't in other phases too, right? Yeah. Because yeah, it's that you know the comment you hear. Well, I can't be racist. I have you know, I have two black friends. So, you know. It's that sort of thing. But so just in the interest of time, I see it's about 7.35. Um, so you had started to talk about autonomy, you know, and uh, if, if, if folks are familiar, like with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, self-actualization, this is sort of where that one <laughs> resides. Um, so a tough place to get to, right? <laughs> but hopefully when we grow up, we get there. Um, it really is about after you churn through these other stages um, about really integrating all of those and internalizing um, a new sign, a new definition of self um, as white, understanding uh, what whiteness means um, in our racialized society. And, um, and also uh, through contact with white allies who are doing anti-racism work, you know, to also have a positive feeling about what it means to be white, um, a white anti-racist, right? And to feel, we want to feel pride in um, being white people who are working for justice, right? And not just feel completely, um, you know, uh, 
incapacitated by um, the awfulness that is white supremacy culture, right? We need to we need to be a contradiction to that as white al anti racist allies. So um, and that also helps. You know, we're, we're sort of uh, done churning through those other stages, so we can be re-energized into uh, confronting racism and oppression in daily life. It's like it frees up the space to be able to do that, right? And, um, and it's easier to have authentic relationships with people of color because we've done our work, right? And kind of um, a lot of that messiness, not that we don't slip, <laughs> like I said at the beginning, we don't go back and forth to these, but, but it's easier to come back, um, back to that stage um, after we slip. <laughs> Yeah, this is, I, I am fortunate enough to kind of live here in microcosm, you know, in, in small and local communities. This is, um, I know a lot of people in the work and we're kind of maybe all in the same place so that, um, so we're all proud of being members of that white community that is committed, you know, to ant to countering oppression and to anti-racism and, um, and we, one of the feeling I get when I'm in this space with my people, um, which isn't just white folks, right? Like we we actually create a multiracial space in this. Um, but one of the feelings I get is a feeling of being honored. Like when we're really kind of together, it's I. I and maybe we do a thing, um, whether or not we create safe space for others, you know, who are needing safe space. Mm -hmm. I work with a lot of trans folks too. Um, and, and a lot of people like in the LGBT community and all of that. And when we are able to create truly safe space in a, you know, I, I live in Arizona. We didn't really do big introductions early, but you know, right. this is a pretty awful place for almost everybody. Um, so then it's just feeling honored being with people who are are with each other and with me and whatever. And that is, that's like, it, it's almost like a whole new world from that disintegration place that I am when I'm stressed out, right? Um, and there's just been too much for the day. So... Yeah, we didn't do introductions. I'm just realizing. Sorry. <laughs> we'll do them at the end. <laughs> we'll close out. Um, so, and just uh, so to get it in, we said that we'd talk about the stages of racial identity development for people of color, just so we understand that. So, uh, I'm just going to quickly kind of run through that because it's a little different than for white folks. So, uh, for white folks, there are six stages. For people of color, she's identified five stages. So, uh, and it'll sort of become evident why. So, the first stage for people of color is uh, she's calls the pre-encounter stage, um, and it's where people of color are seeking to assimilate, actually, and be accepted by whites, um, and they actively or passively even might distance themselves from persons of their own race so that they can um, be differentiated. Um, and this de-emphasis on one's racial group membership allows the, the person to think that race has not been or won't be a relevant factor in one's own achievement, right? And um, so we hear that from, uh, you know, people like Ben Carson, right, <laughs> who talks about that, you know, race doesn't make a difference. Um, it's not an impediment to his achievement. Um, the next phase is, and count, so you can you see you can stay in that first phase your whole life. Um, the next stage is encounter, um, and so that is that usually happens in a, with some events that uh, the person of color um, acknowledges that the, in, there is an impact of racism in their life, and they're faced with the reality that they really can't truly be white and have. Uh, white privilege and access to all of the things that white people can. And so, so they're sort of forced to confront the reality of their own identity, their own racial identity. Okay. 
The next phase is also an immersion phase um, that's characterized by uh, a desire to be around um, and have and exhibit signs of one's own racial identity um, and completely avoid the symbols of whiteness, right? So um, they will act, folks in that stage will actively seek out opportunities to explore act, aspects of their own history and culture um, with the support of their peers from their racial group. Um, and we see examples of that in, in all kinds of black popular culture. Um, the next phase would be internalization. And at this stage, um, people of color are secure in their own sense of racial identity. So there's uh, less of a need to assert or quote, quote what she calls a blacker than thou attitude or characteristic of the prior stage. And so um, being a pro person of color doesn't necessarily mean that you are anti-white. So that's sort of where that um, phase comes in. Um, folks tend to be more expansive and less defensive. Uh, and there will also be a branching out of creating alliances with um, other, other groups, um, people of color groups and other oppressed marginalized groups. And then finally, the last stage uh, is internalization or commitment. And folks, people of color in that stage have found ways to translate their sort of personal sense of race into a plan of action or commitment um, to elevate the concerns of their own race as a group. Okay, so this is where you get um, uh, groups that, um, well, the Black Lives Matter movement is a good example of that, right? Um, they're aligning. Um, with all marginalized folks, right? This is where we see, this is where we haven't talked about intersectionality yet. We've kind of literally been in kind of a black and white paradigm, but this is where the notion of intersectionality comes in and aligning um, folks who are also marginalized into activism. Um, and at this stage, uh, those concerns can be sustained over time, right? That's kind of the, the notable characteristic of this stage is that it's sustained over time. Um, and uh, the last thing she says about this is that race becomes a point of departure for discovering the universe of ideas, cultures, and experiences beyond their race. So that they've completely internalized an identity of their race um, and uses, uses it as a basis to, to view the rest of the world um, through that lens. So just to sort of understand that it's a little different for people of color, uh, this racial identity development. And, um, and again, to understand when you come in contact with people of color, where they might be uh, in, in the particular stages. So right, it, and I, I love that, um, you know, that last little paragraph in the end where it says that they can move from one stage to the next, but then they can kind of be thrown back if they have maybe complicated encounters. Um, and honestly, I, I see that both in my friends of color, right? And also in myself and in white friends as well, um, is that when we have new and challenging experiences, whether or not that challenge is ugly or just really hard, um, we can move, you know, kind of back through development or jump around a lot. And I love that she, she names that because again, we think because of white supremacy culture, right? We <laughs> tend to think in a very linear way. And it's like, once you have gotten through to the end, now here you are at the end. Yeah. Um, and, and God, step. I wish we were. Right. <laughs> So is anything coming up for anybody? We have probably maybe 10, 16 minutes left for discussion. I feel like you and I've been doing all the talking, Carrie. I know. So I'm, but somebody better do some talking. I'm just saying. See, you can always attend on me to open my mouth. So 
one of the things that I want to go back to, if if the other folks might be willing, is this looking at this notion of militancy um, that you talked about, Kelly, and and how much of that actually is grounded in our white supremacy and how it might be countered um, by uh, spiritual practices of holy curiosity, of being grounded in the present and really being open and wanting more information and wanting to truly understand, you know, where that other person is coming from, even as you're looking at them and going, how can you possibly be that, you know, but being in that place <laughs> doesn't invite connection. And I think it's that connection that, that actually invites the transformation that we want. Like I've, I've rarely been um, bludgeoned into understanding how wrong I am about something. <laughs> yeah, no, I totally, I get where you're coming from. And this is, I think, where we're kind of a little bit privileged in, if we're doing this in a, in a religious context, right? And we are, we're doing it in a Unitarian Universalist context. I think I see this kind of behavior in a whole lot of other contexts, and it's harder to approach in other movement spaces where we don't have um, a common, at least vaguely common theological grounding, right? Um, so I think we've struggled in the experiences I've had within Unitarian Universalist anti-racist organizing. I think we're kind of on the edge of that. I think you named that really well. I think we sometimes forget, I think we're in such a rush sometimes that we sometimes forget because you know what? And I'm going to say it because I do. I think we a little behind the times. I think we, we, we ought be a little bit further along. So some of us who are very passionate, we're like, we're like, Oh, we have to do it, have to do it. And we do not pause and say, how do we do it in a religious way? Right. Um, and what practices can we put in place to be able to create movement in a way that holds people um, in, in love, right? You know, and I'm not, some, some personalities are much better at that than I am. I am not, this is not my strength, which is why we have people like Donna Renfro on the team, because um, I tend to be a little bit more militant, you know? Um, so, I would love to hear from other people about what they think about including clergy members if there are people on the call other than Donna. How, if you've thought about that or encountered that or worked with that. Okay. <laughs> Donna's, so, out of, Donna, Donna's out of commission. I just wanted to comment on the on the bludgeoning thing, though, and bring us back to the racial identity development stages, right? Because we know that that's a particular stage in someone else's racial identity development. And so that's what we're hoping with the awareness of these stages is that, okay, it's really not about you getting beat up. It's that the other person has this inclination to beat someone up right <laughs> and being able to recognize that oh they're in that stage of development and trying to be and trying to also be kind of self-differentiated right so that you're not responding to their actions as much as understanding where they're coming from so i hope that helps <laughs> oh i think it's very much on both sides i mean i think the same same tools can get used on on both sides you know you can engage in holy curiosity when somebody's belligerently yelling at you. Um, and you can engage in holy curiosity when you're engaging a, a white person who has truly no awareness and knowledge of, of the white supremacy that they have right. instilled in themselves um, over the course of their lifetime. So it's, it's just, you know, plenty of opportunities for growth on all fronts. Yes, for sure. 
So Donna is asking the question, um, how do we experience, any of us on the call, support from clergy and others interested in doing this work as part of your congregation? Well, I can say that our group has just started its own little small group within our church to deal with Black, Black Lives Matter and how it fits into our church and the training that we want to do for our church over the coming years. And we're studying different literature that's out there and courses for them because we know a lot of our church members are older and their minds are set in a different way than the younger members so we don't want to push anything on the older members of our church that they feel uncomfortable with so we're looking for a common ground within all of our membership that we can do the trainings and we've already had a couple trainings that we've done so I'm I'm curious uh, where is your minister in all of this as your minister active our minister plays a very important role our minister is Krista Tavs she's actually been a large part of the Black Lives Matter she was actually in St. Louis during the marches down there. So you're getting a lot of support from your minister? Yes. That's great. That's really great. Anybody else? Oh, there's a, from, um, I'm gonna read Leslie's thing if that's okay. Um, we have a group started by a woman of color called Uncomfortable Conversations. Our minister, whoa, so fast, so fast. Um, our minister asked her to include a white person as a facilitator. So she and I have been working on forming and covenanting with the group, small group, three to 10 people on Sunday morning before church. We recently added childcare. That's awesome. Support is so important, including childcare. Um, our church is also looking for various curricula to raise awareness about systemic racism. We had one round of beloved conversations. Whoa, people are typing um, about, um, but may not continue it. Our minister is very much supportive. That's really great to hear. And that was from Linda Dukes. And then Leslie writes, um, the minister, Reverend Paul Beadle, whom I know, um, sat in on a session and then ended up reformatting it uh, for MLK Sunday service. Awesome. And then from Deborah Boyd, our interim minister has facilitated two diversity learning circles where we are using the IDI, which is the intercultural development, uh, somebody correct me. Um, um, and we also had two book groups going, um, going currently reading Chris Krause's books. Plus, we have a lay chaplain who is deeply involved with local church in an um, in an economic in an econo uh, economically disadvantaged location. I apologize. So it sounds like there are some people who are experiencing a lot of clergy support, which is awesome. Um, I would be curious. We just have a very few minutes left. I would just be curious, and I'm not asking anybody to disclose something that they might not be comfortable in a public and recorded space to do. But if there's anyone who would like to say, um, talk about if they're not, um, if they're not really feeling clergy support um, and wants to name that out loud, I would, I would really welcome that. What I'm finding is not that there is not clergy support, but, and, and this isn't particularly confined to my situation right now, but there's an awful lot of skittishness on the part of very, very um, 
a, a, a very, very um, sound people, um, ministers who are sound on the topic of racism, um, who are just skittish about reading the whole congregation. Um, and, and so, can, and from my perspective, and I tend, like you, Carolina, to be militant, um, but tend to have trouble moving the congregation past the study, study, study stage. So I think, and I'm going to jump in. I hope I didn't interrupt you, Chalinda. Um, I think one of the things we, what I'm becoming much more cognizant of as a member of the laity and as a person who is not involved in some professional capacity within Unitarian Universalism, that a lot of this is very, very hard to do when your job is on the line. I think we can experience a lot of white resistance in congregations. Um, a lot of the people who are maybe early stages of, of racial identity development. And those people are the ones who are going to decide whether or not they're signing our paycheck. And, and I think that that brings me to the one message that I have been carrying for a long time. And I'm very passionate about the lady needs to do this work. The clergy needs to do it too. But this is not the burden of the clergy to do. Um, but we as lay people need to push this movement forward because if we don't push it forward, then our clergy essentially will also be disempowered from moving it forward. And that is what I have to say about that. And I welcome, we just said we have four minutes of time left. So if you've got something to bring, bring it now. Well, I just got to say yes and um, we also need the prophetic voice. We need religious professionals calling us to live out our faith, which is a faith of justice. And we need to increase the faith development of the laity, so it, which includes followership, <laughs> and to uh, recognize the, um, that there is a right to the prophetic voice. We say we have freedom of the pulpit, but we don't always listen to those the words in the pulpit. And so we need to get better at doing that around racial justice. So I just had to say that. And we are almost out of time. So let's introduce ourselves. <laughs> so I'm Carrie Stewart. I'm um, uh, zooming in from uh, the Dallas-Fort Worth area. I'm uh, the Education Resources Coordinator for Allies for Racial Equity um, Steering Committee. I think this is my fourth year. And, um, and I'm uh, an anti-racism trainer by profession and a lifelong UU. I am Carolina Cravart Graham. I am out of Arizona. Um, and that's kind of, I'm, we're, there's a lot of work here and we're trying to do it. Um, I'm involved with a lot of immigration issues, a lot around um, trans issues, a lot around racial justice issues. Um, and what else that like, I don't know. Um, I'm heavily involved in the new sanctuary movement um, with other religious communities um, outside Unitarian Universalism. And I have a cat who has graciously abandoned our conversation. So. Oh, I'm George Herondine out of Quincy, Illinois. I'm in newly involved in the group that we just started at our church to get our role moving within our church on how we want to do Black Lives Matter and racial equality and justice and the training that we want to do in our church. Lori, you want to take us out? I sure, sure will. Thank you all for coming tonight. Really appreciate everyone's uh, involvement in the conversation, both on the chat and in the video conference. Uh, we will be posting links that, that we mentioned tonight in the 
um, in a Google Doc and then posting that into the Facebook event. We have another uh, webinar next Wednesday at the same time, 7.30 Eastern Daylight Time, and that it will be a continuation of this uh, theme of white resistance to doing the work. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lori. As always, fabulous. <laughs> we'll see you next week.